So today we're looking at a number of different passages, uh, one of which is in your bulletin. We're starting at Job 23, and then Amos 5, and then ending off with Mark chapter 10. So we're kind of, oh, and there's another one. We're kind of jumping all over the place here. So lots of scriptures, lots of things to look at, and we're so we're not going to dive deep into all of these scriptures, as the time would not allow for that. Um, but we're going to look at a, a topic here today, a topic that I think uh, has to do a little bit with Halloween. And it may not seem like it has something to do with Halloween, but uh, we'll see how that works in a moment. So I had a conversation the other day, I could call it a conversation, it was a, a post that someone put on Facebook uh, that said, what are people's thoughts about Christians practicing Halloween or being involved in Halloween or taking their kids door to door or handing out candy or what is sort of your, how much do you do, how much don't you do? And then they asked the simple question, what does it look like to do spiritual warfare on a day um, like Halloween? And of course, different opinions came out and different answers and, and it was interesting to have a discussion and to hear um, some people who, who were all the way on this side, some people were all the way on this side, and some people that kind of fit in the middle and and, and work things out in their own way. And um, one of the things that says, what do we do about all the satanic rituals that happen around Halloween? Uh, and of course, there's the inevitable person that says, what satanic rituals? Those don't exist. Um, and and so we had discussions about that. Uh, and I, I like to throw a wrench in things, if you haven't figured that out. So I, I talked about the satanic ritual of selfishness. Um, and he says, well, how is that a satanic ritual? I said, well, Satan fell from heaven because of his pride, his pride of his self. That is the heart of, of Satan, right? And so if we ex experience selfishness in our own life, we are in essence mirroring the heart of Satan in one particular category, one particular area, instead of mirroring the heart of God, which is selflessness, or the heart of Jesus. So that started an interesting discussion. I said, and it's, I think that on Halloween, people are um, doing all over, all over the community without realizing it, they are partaking in this satanic ritual of selfishness. Because we're going door to door to receive candy for only me to eat when I get home, right? And it may seem small and it may seem like it's whatever, it's something little and it's just something for the kids, but to me, well, as a parent, what I look at is, what is this promoting in my children? And so what I chose to do, uh, thinking about it, as we, me and Christine talked about it, going into Halloween, how are we going to do this? Should we uh, engage in it the way everyone does? Should we shelter them entirely from it? Should we simply talk about it and then hand out candy? How should we do this? And so what we decided to do is we would, do, do, we would be in the world, but not of the world in this, in this way, or at least in, in our attempt. So we take the kids out go door to door and receive candy because people seem like they have to give us candy, but our intent for taking the kids out is to give away candy. And so it says, whenever we see other kids around on the sidewalk, we take them up to them and we hand them candy. And it doesn't seem like a big deal to them because they're receiving candy from everyone else. But f my hope anyway is that in my own children's heart that it fosters a uh, way of seeing that we don't have to be doing what everyone else is doing, but we still want to be engaged in a positive way. And so instead of going out to receive candy for me, we're intentionally going out to give away candy for someone else. So that's what we've chosen to do at Halloween. We've done it two years in a row. First year went really well. Last year, we only stayed out like 10 minutes because we were really cold, but we made our, our, our best efforts. So anyways, that's the satanic rituals of Halloween and, and, and selfishness and how that all ties in. So they said, so what does that have to do with spiritual warfare? This was the question someone asked. How do you engage in spiritual warfare on Halloween? Do you simply sit at home and pray and close your doors and, and hope that the demons don't get you? He says, well, what I do at spiritual warfare is I take my kids out and give candy away. Because I said the spirit of Halloween is selfishness. And so to combat that spirit, we do the opposite. We give stuff away. So that might be an interesting uh, way to look at it, or uh, like I said, throwing a wrench in things. But for me, it it it, it does what it needs to do, uh, and it processes through things. I know that is perhaps more simplistic than it could be regarding all of the natures of things about Halloween, but we're not talking about 
specifically about Halloween this morning, we're talking about selfishness. So I thought that was an interesting thing to just open up with, seeing as Halloween is around the corner. Uh, and there we go. So we're going to talk about selfishness, we're going to talk about self-righteousness, self-indulgence, uh, self-pride, and hopefully these are things that we're not going to encourage each other in this morning. Hopefully these are things that we're going to notice maybe about ourselves or about others and find ways to work with these well. And we're going to look at some stories in the Bible about people who had these issues, people who dealt with these things, and sort of why they were like this way, why they were like this, and how, how come we're like this. Because sometimes we can be like this in certain ways without even realizing it until someone else points it out or until God taps us on the shoulder. And one of the most difficult ones to deal with is self-righteousness. That's Job 23, starting at verse 1. And this is a passage later on in the book of Job. We looked at our whole series on the book of Job. We're at the beginning. He's, he's considering, his, he's sort of biting his tongue. And he's saying, okay, God, what are you doing here? I don't really understand, but... Uh, blessed be your name, right? That's where that, that song comes from. You give and take away, blessed be your name. And as the, as the book goes on, as the story progresses, we see Job becomes more and more bitter and increasingly uh, hostile towards God to the point where he's blaming God for all sorts of things that God never did and, and, and putting God on the sand. And this is, this is one of those see, scenes where Job is talking to God, putting him on the stand almost raising himself up to the level that God is at, saying he can, he can duke it out in equal battles in this way. Uh, Job 23, verse 1, says that Job answered him. Uh, he says, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. So he's, he's desiring to come to God's house and knock on his door and have a face-to-face -face conversation with him says, I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. He's going to argue with God, and he's going to try and understand perfectly God's side of the story. Which one of us can do that very well? Um, keep going, verse 6. It says, would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No. But he would give heed to me. There, an upright man could reason with him, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he's not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he uh, hides, and I cannot behold him. And I turn to the right, and I cannot see him. We jump down to verse 16. We see sort of the closing statements of his argument. It says, God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. This is a very bitter man. This is a very self-righteous man, I would say. He's coming, saying, I want to come to God's front door and give a little knock and open up, not to have a conversation with him, not to get to know him better, not really to learn his side of things, but to argue with him, to bring my case before him, to say, God, look, I've done nothing wrong. So why has this happened to me? And then he says, I'm going to hear what God has to say in response and actually understand it. He says, if I, only, if I only could understand what God is doing here, and I would agree with what he says, then maybe he's in the right. But at this point, Job is thinking God is entirely in the wrong in every respect. Isn't that a way to be? And I think there is a measure of complaining about a situation to God, but it's very different complaining about God to his face. And that's what Job's doing here. We'll keep going, we'll look at self-indulgence. This is sort of the next step, where we think that we are in the right all the time. Or we think maybe we can't do anything wrong. Or we think maybe if there is something that has done wrong, it's probably someone else's fault. Or someone else was involved. Or we can blame someone else in some way. And this leads us to uh, self-indulgence, to sort of doing things strictly for ourselves, maybe at the, um, 
uh, putting others down in the process of doing this and not really caring about that. Amos chapter 5 is where we're turning. And this is a scene or a, a picture of something, it's a, a prophecy, so it's something that might happen to, uh, to Israel that he sees. He says, this is going to happen unless you turn from your wicked ways. Amos 5 verse 5 says, seek the Lord and live. Do not seek Bethel, do not go to Gilgal, do not journey to Beersheba, Beersheba, for Gilgal will surely go into exile and Bethel will be returned to nothing. What are all these places? What do all these places have to do with anything? Why is he saying, don't go to this place, don't go to this place, don't go to this place, but seek God? Well, all of these places, if you look throughout the history of Israel in the Old Testament, we see these are places that indicate specific things. If you ever noticed, or maybe you didn't notice, you read, yada, 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 something happened, and, it, and the place was called, there's the name, right? And we see the name, and we gloss over it, it means nothing to us, and we keep going. But then later on, Amos says, all these places that were named, think about what happened there. And now you know what he's talking about. So Bethel is the place where God met Jacob. If you go to that story, and we see God meets Jacob, and says, and this, then the place was called Bethel. Gilgal was the place where the Israelites' uh, spiritual reproach was rolled away in the days of Joshua. And Beersheba is connected with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in a variety of different ways. And so all three of these places are significant places for a Jew religiously. Amos is saying, it's not about all these things. It's not about going to this place, going to that place, going to the other place. It's not about trying to build up your own righteousness within your sort of closed system that you've designed. But instead, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Continuing on in verse 6, it says, Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of jo Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. Verse 10 says, They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who seeks, speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, push aside the needy in the gate. So this is a picture of the things that they were doing. Of the ways in which they were involved in their community. It goes through them and it simply states them in, in closing. They're afflicting the righteous, taking a bribe and pushing aside the needy in the gate. But what is the gate? What does that have to do with anything? The gate is the place in the community where everyone would come to get something settled. It's like a court of law where you have a dispute, you have a situation, and you go to the judge and he gives a ruling. In this case, they all come to the gate and the, the, the village elders would talk it out and hear everyone's side and, and make a decision. And it says, you are so self-righteous. You want to indulge yourself in every way that you are making sure the needy don't even get to the gate, making sure they can never give their case, so that when you give your side of the story, you're the only one that's heard, they didn't make it, so obviously you're in the right. And this is a situation where the uh, rich people were bribing the abiders of the law, or not the abiders, the people who make the law happen, bribing them to take their side, and abusing the poor by overly taxing them for things that they shouldn't have been taxed for, and then when the poor complain, they say, well, let's go to the gates and take our complaint to the gate where we should. And then somewhere along the way, they manage to get it so that that person doesn't show up. Say, well, obviously I wasn't bribing him. Obviously I'm in the right. He didn't show up to make his case, so clearly he, he's in the wrong. And this is something that was happening on a continual basis. And it says, look, you're trying to build these, these grand houses of hewn stone. You're trying to build an empire for yourself. It's all about you. It's all about indulging in your own selfishness. But guess what? You won't be able to live in them. You won't be able to live there. 
But God sees what you're doing. Finally, self-pride. Mark chapter 10. This is a familiar story, and it reminds me a lot of where Job is at. Mark ten seventeen says, As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and he knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And he says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, and you shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. I want to pause there for a moment. Looking at the list of things that Jesus chooses to mention, it's all things that we can do for some kind of personal gain. Murder, for whatever reason, is never for the gain of someone else. Adultery is always something that we do because we need something from some other person or we want something from some person who we shouldn't be getting it from. Stealing, same thing. Just instead of trading bodies, you're trading physical objects. Bearing false witness. Something similar to we talked about in Amos where the rich man comes in and says, no, this didn't happen that way, or this didn't happen the other way. Or maybe it's someone that he told, that he bribed. He says, can you bear false witness for me in this testimony? So when the judge asks you, who's in the wrong, you say it's the other guy, and I'll give you a million dollars if you do it, or whatever. I'm sure it wasn't a million dollars because money works differently. But bearing false witness is never for the sake of someone else. It's always for personal gain, whether we're encouraging someone to bear false witness or doing it ourselves. And then you shall not defraud. Defrauding is similar, just in a, in a different respect. Dealing with things that are all about these things that we can do to gain for ourselves instead of helping someone. It says, don't do those things. Don't live within that spirit of selfishness. Live in the alternate spirit of selflessness. And the rich man says, in verse 20, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Isn't that amazing? Who of us could look Jesus in the face and say, I have kept all of these since my youth? I've never been selfish in any way since my youth. I've never acted out or thought about acting out or, or been involved in any scene where this was happening. And this could be a case where the the man here is intentionally bearing false witness about himself, so he's shooting himself in the foot there. Or, he's being genuine. He, intent he actually believes that he's in the right. Because he's gone on so long thinking that he's in the right about everything, trying to get ahead in every way, that it's become his normal way of life. And so when he thinks about the things he's done wrong, he doesn't have the conviction in his heart, and he says, I've done nothing wrong. I have nothing to hide. And he genuinely believes that he's doing things right. This can be us on any level in life. A way in which we think we've done nothing wrong. Maybe we're not trying to hide something we've done wrong. We actually think that we've done nothing wrong. Until the Holy Spirit convicts us and says, look, Here's a situation. Here's a problem. Here's something I want you to work on. Here's something we need to deal with. And all of a sudden we realize I need more help than I thought. And we fall on our knees and say, God help. I don't know what I'm doing. When I thought I knew what I was doing, everything fell apart. So what is his response to this man? Verse 21, Jesus looked at him, loving him, and he said, you lack only one thing. Sounds easy. Go and sell what you own. Give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And when the man heard this, he was shocked. And he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. 
And Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Only one thing he lacked. Humility. Surrender. Self-denial. He deceived himself into thinking he was perfect. He was so self-centered. But his perfection lies in his perceived perfection. In the fact that he was not willing to give up these things for God. He was not willing to go that next level. See, Jesus is sort of looking at all of the ways in which he's interacted in his life and hearing the way he responds to the question and he thinks to himself, I know what the problem is here. I know what this man's real situation is. And so he speaks to it. Because all you have to do is be more selfless than you could ever possibly be. And his response was, I could never possibly be like that. And he leaves sad. And it's interesting as the verse goes on. This part makes me laugh as you keep going here. Verse 24. The disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. They were greatly astounded, and they said to one another, Then who can be saved? And his answer, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. He doesn't say, For rich people it's impossible. He says, For mortals it's impossible. For every person on the planet it is impossible to be saved. Through your own doing. But for God, all things are possible. And then look at what Peter says in response in verse 28. Peter began and he said, look, we have left everything and followed you. Isn't that fun? He says, it's harder because he hasn't given everything away. And Peter says, I've done that. Look, I give everything away. I left, left and followed you. And you got to wonder what Jesus' response is to that, or what's going through his mind. I think Peter is the, the classic, the foot-in-the-mouth guy, right? He says something, and then you realize, oh, that was the very thing he said I shouldn't be saying, or shouldn't be doing. Uh, I just made a mistake. But Peter genuinely was trying to be uh, right about this, right? He wasn't trying to be facetious or in any significant way. He was saying, no, I've done these things. So, what's the problem? I'm, I'm, I'm righteous, right? I'm going to, going to receive eternal life. Peter in himself, without realizing it, is exemplifying the very thing that the rich man was. Unintentionally being proud about ourself in a certain area where God says, no, you can be more selfless than that. As they say, he was... Uh, humble about his humility, or proud about his humility, a false, false humility. He says, I've given everything away, and I'm, I'm so proud of it. Isn't that amazing? But what does he say in verse 27? For mortals it is impossible, but for God, for God all things are possible. And that's the hope we have, isn't it? If we turn to Hebrews 4 to close us off today. Starting at verse 12, it says, Indeed, the word of God, that is Jesus, Jesus is the living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joint from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one whom we must render an account. It's not possible. Because we have all these things we're unaware of. All these nuances about our life that are playing into our own self-interest without us even realizing it. And so we need Jesus. Because what can he do that we can't do? He can do dividing joint from the marrow. Sharpen the two-edged sword. He can get right in there and say, nothing's hidden from me. All is laid naked, all is laid bare. I know every little piece about you, even the things you don't know about yourself, and I want to reveal them to you to help you grow 
to help you flourish, to help you get better, to help you prosper. So you can go and help other people flourish, and help them prosper. And we can't do that by ourselves. We can't sit in a room and think about all the ways in which we maybe are falling short. Even if we could come up with a list, there's still more we didn't think of. There's still more things that we need help. We need guidance from the Spirit. And so I think an, inten an intentional posture for us, a useful posture to battle this um, problem of selfishness or self-pride or self-righteousness or whatever it might be, it all plays in different ways. It's just to have the posture of being on our knees. Instead of thinking, how can I be less selfish in this situation? How can I be more selfless with this and with that? But God, how can you guide me? Because I don't know all the ways in which I'm doing this. I don't know all the ways in which I'm contributing to this. So God, guide me. Guide me. How can I do this better? How can I do this well? It goes on. Verse 14 of chapter 4 of Hebrews says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession." For we do not have a high, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who is every in every respect has been tested, as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This is the very thing that Job is wanting to do, but the problem was he was trying to do it on his own, by himself. He wanted to enter into the throne of grace and make his case before God and say, look at me, I am righteous all by myself. I did it. But it says we can enter with boldness for what reason? Not because of our own sake. But because Jesus, the word of God, sees every little piece about us and works on it with us. And his grace that give us boldness. That he knows it all, that he sees it all, that we're not trying to hide, we're not trying to reach heaven in some way of our own. We're saying, Jesus, I know that you can guide me. I know that you can forgive me. And it is our confession that leads us forward. And I confess I don't do everything right. I confess I don't know what I'm doing here. I confess that sometimes I can be a bit cranky. I confess. Because he can be for us, but we cannot be for ourselves. For mortals, <coughs> it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. 